But what really interested me about CS is the fact that it is a perpetual problem. It is a perpetual puzzle. And that is kind of how I got interested in medicine in the first place. The problem of diagnosing is what really intrigued me. What I realized in our current data set was that we had very few validation images. So we only had 16, but we had a lot of training images. That's kind of why I decided to not use the current data set split that the data had and created a new split. Yeah, and then we see that we have 1,000 healthy images and 3,000 pneumonia images. And so because of that, we see we have an imbalanced data set, meaning that the number of images in each class are not equal to one another. The imbalance in this data set is not too bad. The first thing I believe is super helpful in any modeling or creating any pipeline is to visualize what the images that you have. So when we look at our images, we do see that they are what we expected. So they are long x-ray images and they're centered around the lungs, which is awesome for us because then the model doesn't have to work with you know, extraneous information. And we have a, you know, a balance of normal and pneumonia images, which is great because we see that in each batch that there's a combination of normal and pneumonia and therefore the model will be able to learn from each class of images. Okay, so this is where we get to the interesting part. The architecture for the CNN, so CNN stands for Convolution Neural Net. It came from this towards data science article. I'll be using the sequential model because it is a lot easier to add layers and it is more intuitive to understand. Um, so the first block is the convolution block. So it's two layers of separable convolution layers followed by batch normalization and max pollinator layers. And then the other block that we're going to be looking at is a dense block. So this is also followed by batch normalization, which is common in a lot of CNNs. Um, so these are the two blocks that we're going to create. And having these blocks means that when we actually create our model, we don't have to repeat a bunch of code. So we can just write con block, you know, and dense block. And we have these parameters. So these parameters can be seen over here. So the parameter for the con block is a number of filters for our separable convolution layer. And the parameters for a dense block would be the unit, so how many nodes you want our dense layer to be, and the dropout rate, so what percent of the nodes you want to ignore when you go through the dropout layer. In the beginning, you convolute your input image, and then you turn that into a single dimension using the flatten layer, and then use the dense blocks to create a fully dense network, and we output a single node. So why do we output a single node? It's because we only have two uh, labels, we only have two classes of images. So zero would mean that the patient is healthy, um, normal, does not have pneumonia, and one would mean that the patient does have pneumonia. So we use a sigmoid function so that way we won't get values that are above one or below zero. Um, and the output of this dense layer would be a probability. So if you get like 0 0.6, then it's more likely to be you know, a pneumonia image than a healthy image, you know, same thing if you get a 0 0.1, it's more likely to be a healthy image. And so depending on your model and depending on your images, you might want to set off, set that cutoff at different levels. So for a majority of the case, it's probably 0 0.5. Um, but for other things, especially in the field of health, you might want to set that higher because you don't want to like falsely diagnose patients with certain diseases because of you know, the effects that that might have on the patient. So there are more pneumonia images. So because of that, we want to set a stronger weight, a higher weight for the normal images so that it will balance out one another. And so when the model sees a normal image, it will think that's a more important image than a pneumonia image, just because of the fact that it's going to see a lot more pneumonia images than healthy images. And now we build our model. So we use strategy scope to make sure that we're going to be running it on TPUs instead of a CPU or a GPU. And this really, really makes everything so much more efficient. For the metrics, we're going to be looking at accuracy because that's something easy to understand. But the problem with accuracy, especially with imbalanced data, is that it can give a false impression of the quality of your model. So for example, if you have a data set that's like 99% one, 
than 1% zero and you have a model that only outputs one, the accuracy will be 99%, even though the model is not that great. So we have to use other metrics to determine how good is our model, you know, what is the quality of it. So in a lot of medical situations, we use like precision and recall. So precision and recall, so what's the difference? So precision is like how many of your positive identifications were actually correct. And then recall is like how many of your actual positive images were labeled correctly. Yeah, and then we compile our model using Atom, which is standard or it's the convention, binary cross entropy because we only have two classes. And then we'll be using our metrics defined up here. And then we fit. Our data. So fitting means we're training our model. So we'll put in our training data set and then it'll go through each epoch. And then after each epoch, the expectation or we hope is that it will do better as the thing runs. And so for us, it was rather quite slow in the beginning. We only had an accuracy of about like 73% after the first 25 runs. We can start fine tuning our model to make sure that it works better. And so for this example, I'm going to be using a early stopping callback and a checkpoint callback. So what these will do is that it will stop the model from continuing to train. And this is important because this also helps with overfitting. Um, and so stopping the model earlier will prevent it from overfitting to the training data. And we're going to change our learning rate. So our learning rate is a very important parameter for the uh, for the model because if you have a learning rate that's too high it'll go past the convergence point and so you will never reach a stable model but if you have a learning rate that's too small then the model is going to run on forever and you don't want that either because <laughs> you have other things to do so a common way to deal with that situation is to use a learning rate scheduler so what this does is that it changes the learning rate after each epoch so we're going to be using an exponential decay function so that after each epoch the learning rate will decrease but it'll decrease by a smaller amount each time and by doing that and training the model again we can get an accuracy on our validation data of 97%. We get position is 99% and then recall is 97%. So that's pretty good. And so an important thing to visualize is, is you know, like the performance of the model, like how precise is it over time? Like how good is the recall over time and the accuracy and the loss? Um, so these are all good things to grab and to visualize to make sure that you understand that you're not going past the convergence point or that you're using a reasonable learning rate for your model. So we also had a separate testing data set. And when we actually look at our testing data set, we see that the accuracy is actually 78% and it's not you know, above 98 and 99 that we saw in our training and our inner validation set. And so this indicates that we did have overfitting and having a validation data set does not necessarily mean that you're immune to overfitting. You can still overfit to your training and your validation data set. And in order to prevent this from happening, you can also increase the regulation. So like L2 regular, regularization for your layers, reduce the epochs that you're running it on, add more dropout layers, make sure that the dropout rate is higher. So there's a lot of parameters that you can tweak to make sure that your model is running at peak quality. The whole process is a rather a trial and error process, but going through a lot of these has really helped me to understand like what exactly I should be focusing on, why my model might be acting in a certain way. Going through this experience has been you know, super helpful, you know, to see that like with high level API, I can still create something that has impact and I can still create something that does pretty well for a model that runs like 15 minutes. <laughs> that has been like a really like, you know, encouraging aspect of this whole notebook to see that the stuff that I read in papers <laughs> can be replicated on a Kaggle kernel with Kaggle data sets with TensorFlow API. And so that's been really cool. <laughs>